Um, and I just know so much about Tom's journey already that I want to dig into with you, with our, our audience. On the other hand, I, um, I know too much. <laughs> I was getting <laughs> ready for this and I searched my Gmail and the earliest of my 746 messages involving Tom that I have archived is from 2006, which was when we were co-teaching at the School of Visual Arts um, and was already phase like two or three or maybe four of our friendship. So we're gonna do the best we can here, folks. We're gonna try to hit the hot spots. <laughs> um, so Tom Hart is a cartoonist and he's the founder and executive director of a comic school, the Sequential Artists Workshop. His 2016 memoir, Rosalie Lightning, Rosalie, excuse me, his 2016 memoir, Rosalie Lightning, de debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. He made mini comics for years, uh, created the Hutch Owens series of graphic novels and books, and has been nominated for all of the major industry awards. His daily Hutch Owen comic strip ran for two years in newspapers in New York and Boston, and his Ali's House, co-created with Margot Dubai, was picked up by King Features Syndicate. He's been called one of the great underrated cartoonists of our time by Eddie Campbell and one of my favorite cartoonists of the decade by Scott McCloud. And I will tell you, he is one of my favorite cartoonists and humans of all time. Oh. So our careers have moved in parallel in many ways, and we're gonna to touch on a bunch of this. Um, Tom started in mini comics, and the world of comics was just totally an indie thing, um, moved into sort of small comics conventions and growing into indie publication. Um, we both moved to New York and taught at SVA, at School of Visual Arts. We both moved away from New York because it was too stressful and crazy. Um, and we both have started our own teaching enterprises. So there's a lot of crossover there. And Tom, I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> gosh, thanks. That's so what, That was such a, a rich introduction. Um, and I'm sure we've shared tons of emails prior to 1996. We just had different email addresses or something. But exactly, um, exactly. yeah. Uh, but thanks so much. And it's really an honor just to, um, to speak to the, the people that you've gathered here. Thanks so much. Um, we should just get in, into it. We should it. get into it. We have yeah. so much to do. Yeah, so yeah. I'm a little worried. Okay, so right. let's just start with now. Let's get the, because a lot of people, for a lot of people, you're going to be new, a new person. And so I want to start with what's going on right now. And sure. so you founded your brick and mortar actual school yep. called the Sequential Artist Workshop in Gainesville in 2012, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's still running in real life. Um, but of course, it's all online right now. And also, mm -hmm. there's an online you know, segment that is always online, right? But you just moved to Providence. Mm -hmm. So what is your work life like? Like, what do you do all day? Uh, it's such a tricky time to ask that question, right? Because of the pandemic. And, and the main issue there is my, my uh, school age daughter is always home. So I'm really wrestling with, with um, helping her get through what schoolwork would be, but also manage the feelings of not having seen her friends in so long and not being in school. And so honestly, most of my days these days, most of my time these days is spent um, handling the mental health of a seven-year-old. Um, but pr let's say prior to the school year, a lot of my time is spent um, in the community at SAW, like in the online community, again, and this is the pandemic time. Um, talking with people, keeping people going, and then carving out a few hours for myself a day, if I can, to sort of run in parallel with them. A lot of times, um, if they're working on projects, I'm working on projects. Um, and a lot of the frustrations they're having, I'm, I'm having. I'm not sure if that's by design or just something that's happened over the course of all my teaching, but I tend to be um, just as frustrated as my students, and I, I, I sort of try and share it with them. Which I know is such a it's such a valuable thing, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today is um, that you're always so generous with your um, your own process and like the way things work for you and the way things aren't working for you and all those other kinds of things. And I think that's that's exciting, and I think it makes a huge difference to students to get an act get some access to that. Yeah, um, I don't know if that's a natural proclivity, right? But I I do have this desire to share the process a lot, and I've noticed it. And in fact, at least twice in my life, I've gone through an intense creative process, I would say with the comic strips and then with um, uh, with my memoir. And then after the fact, I've written a book debriefing on the process. And it just sort of happened naturally. I'm just like, what am I gonna do next? Well, of course I'm going to explain everything I just did, <laughs> which um, it, I don't know, it's just this natural need to share the process. And it might also like be seen in my earliest mini comics, which like the last few pages would always be a wreck of just like notes and other stuff. So I, I think there's always been this this 
desire to be transparent about how the process works and and what it is I'm experiencing when I'm trying to make this thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think I mean I think you and I share a pedagogical gene, you know, <laughs> like maybe I, my very various very earliest stuff. I was talking about materials and process mm. and had a DIY section on my website, um, and I know you and I shared a lot about you know how how we're doing how we're going to manage this all like even from very earliest days for sure yeah um before we move on from what your life looks like right now can you tell us where you're sitting tom i'm sitting <laughs> like i it for our podcast the, listeners the pandemic people. times are a little strange so um the best space i could carve out for this call is underneath my daughter's loft bed and it is her art gallery too you can see all these lol coloring pages that she has made uh, dozens of them all lined up and uh magnetized on her bed and um Anyway, yeah, this is sort of the best spot where there's actually silence and I could, because um, my side of, of the house is really next to this like really busy road and also Molly Rose is always home and she's always in the living room, which is nearby too. So this is like my silent corner during the pandemic is her loft bit. I love that. <laughs> like, it's so adorable. Can you see the picture of Spock over here? That It's a Christmas present. She's really in love with Spock yes, all of a sudden. Yes, so. I can see that. <laughs> So yeah, for our future um, listeners who are not seeing the video, this is like, mm. I initially thought what we were looking at here was like a large lofted like warehouse space uh -huh. or something. And no. <laughs> the bed, the bottom of the bed was like, so the perspective totally changed as soon as you told me where you were, it then like shook and like shrank. She's got this. She's got this great desk set up underneath the loft bed, and it's perfect, actually. And she gets a lot of work done here. She, it's kind of a quiet space, safe space for her, and, and but I'm stealing it for the moment. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so um, going back to uh, how you know how does your life work right now? Um, we were talking the other day about this, and um, can you talk a little bit about how you make your living now? How do you support your family? You know what, like because um, saw, which is short for sequential artist workshop, um, you pointed out that you were already in transition from being all and originally all in person to having a few online offerings to just like just flooding into that area and just really committing to that so can you talk about that a little bit sure um well going back from i would say mid 2000s like 2005 or something maybe even earlier i realized like the only way i was going to make a living was was multiple revenue streams you know there were, like just get whatever I can from wherever I can because together it might add up to something feasible um, and um, back then that was you know teaching SVA was one thing uh, I was doing a lot of freelance work for um, an ad agency that I worked for very intensely for two or three years and then off and on for five or six or something like that and then whatever other kind of gig you can kick, pick up but eventually even that got too difficult in New York and so that's why we moved to Gainesville, Florida. And at that point, that's when I was like, well, I've taught so long. I, I love teaching. Other people have founded schools, meaning one person, my friend James up in Florida, I mean, up in Vermont. And, uh, and so I was like, well, I'm going to start a school. Um, also partially because I don't, I think, I don't think I'm very hireable in other ways. So I wasn't going to like look for a job. I was just going to make a job. Um, so yeah, in 2012, that school started. And I think in that first year, I made $6,000 from the school and that was working 60 hours a week on it or something insane. I don't remember where the other money came from, but it was definitely other revenue streams. You know, I was picking up jobs at, at the University of Washington. We might have also had a couple freelance jobs come in at that point. Um, and well, I even think Leela had a book at that point that she was working on. Right? Yeah, I don't know where in the sort of revenue that that was at the time I think that was sort of towards the end of her book project which means she would have gotten another lump sum towards the end of that that's how that usually works um, I think I picked up even a couple animation gigs were from New York contacts still those sort of eventually dried up when people but eventually people were like hey are you still around you want to do an animation thing I'm like I'm a thousand miles away but I can probably do it and so there was a bunch of that um, so but slowly I've been trying to get it so I'm less and less tied to other things and mostly just focused on saw and that's finally happened this year nine years later or something um and so my main revenue stream at the moment 
I was a contractor for the school, I should say. Even even running it as an executive director, I was just like, well, you know, I was just like picking up scraps and paychecks from the school when I could, you know, paying myself when I could. I only put myself on salary, a measly salary, about a year and a half ago. And I finally gave myself an okay raise. <laughs> uh, June. <laughs> Actually, maybe more like March. But um, So yeah, so SAW is my main source of income. I don't even like taking other gigs at this point. Um, I don't like spreading my attention that much. Um, right. Well, but, I mean, you said that you were, you just said that you were thinking like in the past you thought I need to um, have multiple streams of income in order to make things work. And it sounds like, and from what I, you know, our conversations, it seems like that's not how you're seeing it now. But now you see it as it actually needs to be focused, needs to be the one stream of income. Um, but then True. the question that I think a lot of people have, and um, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, so we don't need to get into it in detail now, but what does that mean about your creative work? Because the earlier Tom, the reason you're trying to get all these different income streams going is because you're trying to still make comics the center mm-hmm. financially, mm-hmm. as well as identity-wise. Is that right? Y- yes and no. It's, at a certain point, I realized that comics wasn't going to support me financially like my own vision you know it's sort of a hard realization at some point maybe other people are smarter than I am but I think there's a hard realization when you realize like there's a minimal number of slots for the people whose whose personal vision will be um, supported financially right and I, I just at some point realized like oh you know I like making books some people like my books um but they're not going to pay the bills clearly they're not going to pay the bills and um it it can be it can be a a rude awakening but to me it was an okay awakening it was like oh okay there are other creative things i can do um that can pay the bills and like so when i did a bunch of advertising and pr work it was a really creative job it was a lot of a lot of fun creative stress and paid really well it was actually eventually too much creative stress and i got out of that but um um, but a partial answer to your question, and like, so those multiple revenue streams were the way I was making a living, and and my own vision, my own comics, was a paltry, paltry part of that. Um, um, but it supported it, and I still did it quite. I was quite active and prolific during those times when I wasn't making much money, even on that. Um, but now, you you saw correctly that like I'm I'm trying to condense it to one revenue stream, but, and that's one. I would almost say it's one sort of middle point because the revenue streams from the sequential artist workshop in general are multi, very multi, um, all over the place. And, um, but I'm trying to make it that that's the only place paying me just because I want some stability in, in, in our finances. I want to know next month I can pay. We're going to have the same, roughly the same number of bills and the same amount of money coming in, that kind of thing. I loved your quote when you, you shared a bunch of history with me and you said, I started a school like most people start a band. <laughs> it's true. I was like, well, we need a space. Well, you know, I mean, there's so many things. There's so many reasons why people could tell me, you can't do that. That's like not, that's not the right way to do it. You know, you didn't get uh, the right equipment. You um, don't have the right permits. You don't you know you don't know how to play guitar or whatever I was like I mean the one thing I can do is I can teach pretty well and I think I'm a, I'm a, a trustworthy and reliable teacher from there I just said all right let's build something around that and you know I chose an affordable place that had spaces um, I found the best teachers I could and we created a small community and it grew and it grew and it grew yeah but but um but yeah it was just like hey let's start a band <laughs> let's start a school yeah. Yeah, I absolutely um, empathize with that impulse. It's been something I've done over and over again. Like, we're just, I'm just doing this. This mm-hmm. is like the most logical thing to do with my time. You know, you're, you're a guy who's then, you've been working in like web design and PR, and you're like, I'm unemployable. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> uh, I, I know, that's probably, yeah, I know, that's probably not true. I, yeah, there is probably a, a, a Earth 2 version of me or a parallel universe of version of me that's, you know, creative director in some PR firm or something but for whatever reason I did not want that that path at all yeah you know related I, I, I think you're 
I hope people will find this related. There was a certain point, I can't remember, mid-2000s maybe, when I was um, with uh, my wife's relatives, one of whom is a uh, next one generation older and is a lawyer, and, and it was like maybe Passover dinner or something. He was saying, yeah, I have no idea where my next client's coming from or what next month is going to look like. And I was like, wow, if a lawyer is, <laughs> is saying the same thing I'm saying, then I just might as well stay an artist. You know, it's not... If they're if they're having to sort of figure it out on the go constantly, then there's not much shame in what I'm doing, and that, I think actually the 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 shame that I was not like rich and famous and and um, having an easy time of it really weighed heavily, but that, that helped let it go a little bit. Yeah, no, it's for sure. <clears throat> I think it's when you realize that other people, like lawyers, for example, not everybody, but other people do have essentially small businesses mm-hmm. and have to figure out the same kinds of things, then you know, it, it changes your perspective on what you're doing. But I think too, your perspective on sequential artist workshop and the, what your role is there, not just I'm the director, I'm the teacher, but you are the CEO. Like you are the person who has to make the decisions. Like that's really shifted over the last few years. Yeah. I've had to learn a lot of business skills. Half of them I learned from you. Um, I don't like learning them. <laughs> but I gotta, you know, I, otherwise I would be taking that Earth 2 path. I would be saying, okay, can I have a job? Show me to my desk. And But but I definitely don't want that. So I'm like, give me some tools to help me figure it out myself and I'll, and I'll do so. And honestly, I'd rather be drawing, but <laughs> I enjoy this second most, you know. And yeah. part of me, part yeah. of me probably enjoys it just as much. Yeah, I mean, I find, I find the process really creative, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see. I wanted to make sure we hit on some more things here. So let's say, what does um, what does success what does success look like to you? Well, whew. I mean, there's oh boy, there's probably a short answer someone wants, but I don't. I, um, freedom to some degree, you know, a little bit of autonomy. Um, and I, I'm really grateful that there's that we're in a time where autonomy is a little easier to come by. You know, this is the the web has made so much so many things different. Do we still calling it the web, the internet? I don't know what we call it these days. But anyway, the, the information age, all Super that stuff. Super highway. Yeah. Um, you know, the way in which we've all become connected in the last twenty years has made um, becoming autonomous way easier. You know, someone with my skill set, which is medium. You know would have had no choice but to get a job in a PR firm or an advertising firm 30 years ago. Um, certainly any 40, 50, yeah. Um, so uh, that autonomy is so refreshing and partially because I just do have this rebellious punk rock, rebellious streak where I need to see things done with at least some uh, some amount of idealism still, uh, still intact. Um, so success is like, can... I make things that mean something to me and can I help people make things that mean something to them and that isn't just feeding a commercial engine which I realized I was trying to do in New York in various ways Um, but I just want to help people connect to that sort of expressive creative part of themselves and I want to do it for myself too and so that's the balance it's like here let me help you but I'm not doing it enough myself you know Um, but that's 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 success it's just being able to to have the the freedom the resources um to do those two things help people be more more themselves creatively yeah i i think that's i mean that's the dream right it's it's i think it just turns out to look different than we thought it was gonna look somehow yeah you know i mean it, it, it's hard to you know ask a, a much younger person the dream and it's going to be to um i remember asking you know i was friends with a great number of cartoonists in, in my early 20s in the, in seattle washington and i think we had similar conversations like what is it you know what does it mean to you and i remember megan kelso she said she just she just wants a line of books with her name on the spine i was like yeah that's cool and um and but for me it was more like it going back to what we were saying earlier about the process it was more about just always staying true inside of the process that was 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 really important to me I did want to make a bunch of books but more importantly I wanted to like 
always be sort of alive inside the process of it. Because you and I both know people who have made tons of books, but for other people, or maybe they were done for hire and they're not proud of them. I'm not proud of all my books either, so maybe that's a bad <laughs> angle to go down. But um, but I don't think merely making book work um, would have been satisfying and is, is a measure of success for me as much as staying true inside the work I'm making. But I've been right. Well, it's a choice because I think that both you and I have gone in a direction of, in terms of uh, making our lives work financially, of not trying to make the books pay the bills. Um, but we know other people who mm -hmm. seem to be pretty happy making the books pay the bills and mm -hmm. trying to. But then that's their day job essentially, and then they have the books that are their personal vision projects. Um, I don't and, have that kind of energy or talent to do both of those yeah I mean some for some people that's the way but I don't think that that has to be the way you know I right. think for a lot of creative people it seems like it's got to be that or you, you know it, it has to be all like if you're not making all of your living from the, the primary thing you're trying to be doing then what are you doing you know mm -hmm. um, and one yeah. of the things you said so I wanted I did want to ask you like what does success look like for when for you when you started and you basically just answered that but you said something oh. also in some notes that you sent me about a voracious determination to be seen. Can, this seems like a key piece of this, right? Because you can make things that are true to yourself all you want, but if nobody's looking at them, then... Yeah, I don't know what that's about, to be honest, but it's true that, like, um, you know, you and I started out before the internet, so, like, being seen meant one of two things. It meant, well, it meant getting things into the mail, into somebody's hands, <laughs> or showing up at the right parties or a party any any party um conventions might suit might be called a party um i don't i don't know why but when i when the f switch flipped on for me to start making comics and it wasn't until i was like 20 probably um even 21 maybe and in most people it's like nine or 12 you know <laughs> for me it was like 20. i didn't really start making comics but once i started i didn't stop and it was because i just realized that it was a way to be recognized or, or a way to just be seen. Um, and so I would make a mini comic and I would hand it out and I would make another one. I made one just because Julie Doucet was moving to town and I knew there was going to be a party and I wanted to give Julie something. So I made this mini comic. I was like, this is for Julie um, because I love her and I want her to see me, you know. Um, and other events would be would be reasons to make a mini comic too like oh there's a convention coming up let's make a new one and and people still do that now and but i just i, I don't know why i don't know if i quote felt unseen um i don't know that that also goes hand in hand with believing that and i think every creative person does this they believe that their version of what they're doing is um, un, is like unrecognized and no one's been doing it this way yet you know no one's told this story yet or no one's made a comic this way yet and I and I really want to I got to you guys you people have to see this you know there's so there's that part too it's not just about seeing the person as much as like the the thing you can do with the medium you know the the sort of trick even sometimes um, so yeah but I, I've always had that I have that less now because I'm comfortable um, with the community that's that I'm a part of and created largely, um, but yeah, but for the early parts of, of my career, I was just I was I, I just kept cranking out work, all of which I'm proud of. I'm proudest of my my like my rattiest, um, sloppiest early like just get it out there and be seen work. I'm prouder of that than the like oh, I'm a sophisticated creator who knows what he's doing, which I wasn't. Um, less proud of that work <laughs> well I mean but you kept coming back to sort of first principles throughout all these periods where you would um, you know go at something in a certain way with a certain sort of set of, of artistic just an approach right so many comics just to make stories about whatever it is and mm -hmm. then but then you would <clears throat> get Sort of examine things from a, a more experimental point of view and you do things like um creating prompts on cards mm -hmm. that would you could pull up and react to and that there's like an improv level to the works that you were creating so there's i i feel like you did constantly look for ways to make your practice new for yourself and exciting 
as well as in parallel with this thing of like needing to be seen and needing to build community around your work, needing to find ways to build connections around your work. Um, and the, the mini comic scene, and I'm going to stop and let you answer this <laughs> in a second, but like the mini comic scene for anybody who's not really aware of this in the nineties was like, um, mini comics are not necessarily small, although in some cases they are, um, but they are self-published, usually photocopied, hand bound, usually with staples, you know, very inexpensive little booklets that you can exchange or sell or whatever. And um, in this pre, just pre-internet phase, there was a really huge scene of mini comics that I was involved in and Tom was, and that's how we know each other. And um, it involved sending stuff through the mail often, you know, and making these connections through, you know, people would send me $2 in an envelope and I would send them back comics. I actually don't know how we met Tom. I can't remember, <laughs> but it has to be something like that, you know, or being at, you know, SPX or SPX, something like I that. Think, yeah. Yeah, so SPX is Small Press Expo, which is still running. It's a, an annual Small Press Comics Festival. And, um, you know, so we, there are all these different ways that you have these sort of touch points around. And at that point, there was no way to be, like, the highest I could imagine in comics in, like, 95, 96 was to be published by Fantagraphics. <laughs> that was, like, as far as it went. Mm -hmm. And then I was published by Fantagraphics in 1996. And I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, but there's the, so it's like these parallel things. And so to get back to this thing of like renewing it for yourself, when you're doing your mini comics, and you're just like putting stories down and just doing the thing. And then at some point, you know, what happens? You sort of gather yourself up and go like, no, I need something new. Like what, how did that play out for you? Oh, as far as cre creatively. Yeah. I don't know. There, there's something that was always, always I was always looking for a new expression you know like um, if I it, it was never about the story to tell for me and that's different from a lot of creators who I know are, are like bursting with a particular story they want to tell but for me it was like what can this process and this product and the end in the end result what can it show me about myself and I always was very gratified by surprises that would turn up in the work and surprises that would turn up in the process um, and so I was always after a little while making prompts and sort of designing like weird uh, strategies to sort of get myself not to do the usual thing and so when I wouldn't do the usual thing it would usually be a failure because I'm not so talented that my failures are awesome like prints or something <laughs> so so that's so I keep I, I've now learned to keep most of the failures to myself and I have gobs and gobs of sketchbooks and things and I enjoy the kind of playtime in there but um but uh but it was something about yeah everybody sort of finds their own sort of creative process and and what what really engages them about the creative process and like I made a book my first like commercial book was in 1994 or something. I think I made it in 93. Um, Hutch Owens working hard. I made it the right way, the quote right way. I like I thought up the story, and then I broke it down mostly into a script, and then I made a rough draft of it, and then I sort of refined that rough draft, and then I tr made the final pencils, and then I inked it. And at the end, I was like, that I I didn't enjoy that, <laughs> you know. And so my and I was mostly going on intuition at that point, so I just knew I knew I had to do something different. The next project was um, was I just changed up. I said like, what if you just like don't have a story? What if you just say? What if you just go like loud? What if you just do loud stuff? And then you do soft stuff. And then what if you tell stuff with narration and then not narration? And just like so, I just like those were like the prompts, and that that gave me the clues that I could change the process, and that would. The, the surprises it would reveal would be really helpful and really make me happy and stuff like that. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense and actually makes me think of another question that I had um, about Rosalie Lightning, the book, um, and how you've said that, that this was, in some ways, you, it's really hard for you to even think about what the book is um, and, uh, you know, how... You know, it's obviously you're talking about the the black hole of losing Rosalie and how awful it is, but then using the art in some way as a way to process trauma. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, and 
in in some ways, I see that same kind of looking for um, an answer through experimentation and improv in your life at that time. You know, the events in the story. I'm getting a I'm getting a visitor. Are you seeing? Right at this right right at this time. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I need to be on this call a little longer, okay? Hey, all right, hang on, Jessica. Sorry about that. It's um, okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think all the all of that, what you've just said, all, all and all of the work I'd done prior to that, um, in trying to, I guess, stay nimble inside the medium and to sort of have to sort of know what my options were inside the medium. I think that did help me make that book, which was largely a process of, of figuring out how to grieve and how to, how to move on. And um, I, I don't know if I, 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 I don't know if I hadn't been such a restless creator prior to that, if I would have had the tools I needed. But again, I'm, I'm a particular person and those are the particular tools I needed. And so I had been gathering them, you know, coincidentally or accidentally prior to that. Um, a different person might need to make a different book, right, to get through a process like that. And maybe they, hopefully, they would have the tools they need. Um, is that answering your question? Because um, a lot of what did what I did in the 20 years prior, however many years, like a lot of the creative habits I had I'd, um, developed and a lot of the sort of odd strategies I'd come up with did help in that process. Yeah, I mean, I, I it absolutely ask, answers my question. I really, I mean, um, in the context of your answer, I was thinking about like how would I deal with you know something awful like that, a, a terrible event, um, and I don't think I would have the same resources, you know, the same set of strategies to kind of go through and 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 use for myself. Um, I think it's really it's it's really interesting how how that artistic practice fed you and s sustained you. Yeah, it, it really, um, it, it, it definitely showed me that, that the connection that I have with this art form is a real one and a beneficial one um, because I knew what I, I knew, I knew what I, where I had to go, right, as a person. I knew what I had to say. I knew what I had to believe. I knew how I had to feel, but comics was the only way I could get to those places um, and um, and so that it was so essential that I make that book um, it was one of the I, I've been asked a lot of times like how much of that book was for yourself and how much of it were you thinking about the reader and, um, and th the answer is, is I was thinking about the reader a little bit but mostly I was making a book that that it was just like tunneling tunneling through with the tools I had and the tools I have, again, I'll say, are remedial. That's why it's pretty sloppy in some places. I, I but, mean, I will have to disagree with that. We'll have okay. to disagree. But like, I think well, your nice. tools are incredible when it comes to making comics. And that's, I think, the proof of, of that is exactly what we're talking about, that you had what you needed when you needed mm -hmm. it. You know? mm -hmm. um, one thing that struck me about the book um, as I was rereading it is that you talked about the um, incredible stress and pain of being just super broke. <laughs> in parallel with this off this like the worst time in your life you know that mm -hmm. that's just sort of fed into it and i realized again i i had no idea like i did not know that was going on in that way um i mean you know when we were still in new york like we were both in new york at the same time we both left near the same time mm -hmm. you left a little bit before i did um it, we worked together you know we co-taught classes we hung out you know um, we both had children near the same age um but I had no idea what was going on with you. Um, and I wonder what that is about for you. Cause I think that happens with a lot of people in the arts and in general, where it's like, you know, you and Leela kept it close to the chest in some ways. Hmm. Um, not like you're gonna go around and say like, hey guys, you know, rent party time, but you know, nobody was giving you emotional support either through this, um, apparently, at least from what I could read. Yeah, uh, I, I mean it's a big it's a big silent thing, right? How um, 
how broke <laughs> creative professionals tend to be and it's only now filtering into the public discourse about like um adjunct teachers of say all kinds you know so it's not uncommon for like there to be an adjunct science teacher who's living in their car or something you know you hear stories like that all the time so like finally like the just the way our system is set up you you're starting to realize that a lot of people aren't taken care of or aren't even who are putting in extreme efforts or even who are you know if you're not in the right sort of revenue stream you might get yeah you might find fall through the cracks we weren't quite there yet but that's why we left we left Right. And I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, we had our own financial strains and not as severe, but plenty. And we didn't talk to you about it either. You know, mm -hmm. why weren't we talking to each other? Why weren't we saying like, hey, this is what's going on? Yeah. Money is so taboo, right? It's so weird. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a money talk. If you want to have a podcast about money, well, I'll... this is a podcast about money. Oh, is it? Well, we'll, we'll go deeper then. What else, what else do you want to hear? Or what else do you want I don't talk? know. I mean, I don't know. I'm just wondering about like, because this is this is a podcast about how do you make your work and how do you, mm -hmm. you know, keep it going? And also like, how do you keep it going? Like, how do you keep body and soul together? You know, so um, you sort of yeah, have to make thinking about. Go ahead. We're just thinking about how like the part of the purpose of being here is that, you know, and having this conversation and having these people here with us um, is to to open up these conversations around where does your revenue come from and like how do you manage it like how do you balance the different pieces of your financial life and your creative life and not let one take over yeah you know to the detriment of the other the, I, I mean it all comes down to bargaining right and what you're willing to bargain like it, it seems like how much like how much how much fear am I willing to live with? How much shame am I willing to live with in order to access this freedom or creativity or whatever you want to call it? Maybe it's not even those things. It is for me um, to be in touch with the, the creativity and to be in touch with the sort of autonomous version of the creativity. Other people, it's that they... And also, of course, I didn't even mention it because it's not wasn't part of the calculus so much. How much poverty do you want to deal with, right? And to get to that, and so for me, the poverty was always like I can deal with a lot of poverty, um, and I can deal with some fear. Um, I mean, I guess you just I just wound up poor, <laughs> so but like I could deal with a lot of poverty, but only so much. Like I mean, it's constantly there's like so much calculus involved and so much bargaining. It's like, are we really willing to? To, to go through this to keep our to keep our vision alive or to keep or to not do a certain kind of work that would that goes against some value system we have or maybe you know and everybody's value system is different and not, mine is probably completely blind in some ways but um, you know why don't I get a normal job or even a normal teaching job I don't know <laughs> Why do I settle? Why did I settle in 2012 for six thousand dollars in order to form my own school? I, I mean, I'm, I don't know. Um, well, there's two things that I want to ask about. First of all, as you mentioned, shame. Uh huh. Why shame? Why do you feel like you have part of the? And I'm not saying you don't. Like it's not a thing. But like, why is that part of the calculus around this? Well, shame's going to come from two different places, right? At, at least two, right? It's going to come from the larger society, which is and it's going to come from your like family unit and the larger society at least in my head in my w world told me for a long time i should be um i should be making a, a living from my from my art um it was a young person's shame i think i didn't realize that having a, a, a high paying job um in advertising doing work for sony and mcdonald's it was making a living from your art you know just not your your quote your vision or something and so i felt a lot of shame about that other people have a lot of shame coming from their parents i didn't have as much about that um and then the family we currently live with may we may feel in that direction but for the longest time i i um and you may feel it from other creative professionals too um and so for the longest time, I thought the goal was to make a living off of your art. And again, your, I say your vision. And if you're not, you're a loser. You're a failure. You don't belong. You, um, you're, you're just not, you're not one of us. And you're not, you're not creative, you know. And so 
you know, it took it was a long time of slowly push rolling that ball. I don't know why I chose rolling a ball as a metaphor right now, but slowly cleaning that ball off or something. I don't know. Let's keep that. Um, so eventually I got fine with like, you know, I don't hear that much as uh, that, that shame anymore, you know, um, and the poverty, you know, I have my limits and I sort of know what they are and I can live with them. Um, and fear, I don't, well, it depends on what you're afraid of. Like if you're afraid of living in your car, that's different than the fear of sort of the vulnerability that happens in certain creative projects or something, or the fear of, you know, failure that can happen in certain projects. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's just all, it's all, it's all bargaining. Happy to keep talking about that. I think I hit on a bunch of things there. A little, yeah, broad, and a bunch broadly. of really, really interesting things. And I think that that feeling of shame, um, the, the internalized shame of feeling like you should be making a living from this. And if you're not, it's, it's not the real thing. Like you're not really it is yeah. one of the biggest things I see happening around. Um, and one of the most important things to, to sh shed is that idea that somehow it, all of your income has to be coming from your sort of heart centered creative work in order for it to be the work that's most important to you. Like it can be most important to you and still not have the financial power of your life, you know, it can yeah. fuel you no matter what. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, we need to um, get on to Q and A to make sure we have time, but I have one more question for you related to this that I want to make sure I ask, which is, so you talk about poverty and feeling comfortable to a certain level with you know, that you know what your limits are. One of the things about poverty though, and I mean, I see this playing out um, in Rosalie Lightning in the book um, a little bit, is like making decisions based on financial scarcity that can lead to weird decision-making. Uh -huh. <laughs> sometimes it turns out fine, but sometimes it really doesn't. And like that idea of just kind of, you know, um, again, in your career retrospective list that you sent me, the, the kind of like constantly more things, like another thing, another thing, another thing, like trying all this stuff, that that um, can come partly out of ambition and out of joy and out of, you know, I want to do all these things. And it can come partly out of like, oh my God, I've got to plug this hole. And like, yeah. all you can see is like an inch ahead of you. You know, you have tunnel vision mm -hmm. around it. Does that, do you recognize that at all? Um, yeah, like, yeah, it's hard to pick apart ambition from that plugging the hole that you mentioned. Um, I mean, there's a, I think there's a bunch of threads there. Like ambition, a lot of times is plugging a hole. Like a lot of people, you get down to it, like, and they're they're still trying to impress one person from when they were seven. You know, <laughs> everything they do, they're just trying to impress their father, their mother, some girl they saw on a playground, or some boy they found. You know, whatever. Maybe to maybe middle school. Or maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something a little more, there's a little darker there. Or maybe there's something with more of a, the, you know, you see this in some religious backgrounds too, where like I always believed I had to do this thing and I'm, you know. So plugging the holes, I don't know. I, 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 I Related to that, I'll, I'll get to that actually, since since that brought that up. The, the scarcity for me was I, I grew up in a pretty just sort of lower middle class background around me to my eyes as a young person everybody was unhappy nobody was happy and everybody worked all the time i didn't want that to be me and that's the hole i'm always trying to plug or like that's the thing keeping me on the on the sort of always running <laughs> you know it's like i that's what's that's what's over there i'm going over there um and so is that ambition is that plugging a hole is that scarcity i don't know when you know there's a lot of talk about scarcity mindsets and things like that and i think it's really valuable and i try i've i think i've done an okay job of shedding my scarcity mindset about money in the past like three or four years time is another one and i'm a little worried about whether i'll ever be able to shed that scarcity mindset because that is finite um but i don't know am i answering your question i feel like we could go longer yeah, on that yeah, we, we could nervous. definitely go longer on okay. all of these things um so last question for you is, what would you, Tom of today, tell Tom of, say, 1995, and what would that Tom tell you? Like, what would you, what, what do you wish you'd known then, and what does your younger self wish you still remembered? Uh, 
Oh, what I wish I still remembered. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to answer that one. I don't think. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> um, I I wish I'd understood the industry better. You know, the industry again. I thought there was a certain kind of pro, you know a certain projected uh, timeline for a person making an independent comic who then like just increases in popularity if you keep making better comics and then you're a, and then you're a famous pro or whatever. I don't even know what the word would have been. But that's so much, you know, the, the sort of metaphor of the long tail helps us see that a little better now, right? There's like this many Stephen Kings and things like that or whatever, and then there's everybody else. And had I had that metaphor then, that might have helped me understand. Um, it, it would have helped me uh, forge a path, which I instinctively did anyway, just clumsily and stuff it would help me forge a path in the creative arts taking as many different opportunities as, as I could and, and learning things rather than believing that my natural path was to be published author famous published author everything's good once you start selling this many copies and everyone loves you and publishers are you know having bidding wars over your next projects or whatever um, and what was the last question what should Younger, so what would younger your, Tom. What would younger you think of you now, basically? Think of where you've landed. Well, to be honest, I think of that all the time. I think he'd be okay with, with me. It's like I had to suffer the poverty, you know, and I had to like work through the shame and things like that. But I, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty proud of what we've done. I, I don't have this. I, I don't know if I'll ever have the skills to be a, a mass communicator or the 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 tools to be as as um, seamlessly and maybe uh, seamlessly integrated into the community, the larger community, the society, like Saw is, is ramshackly. Um, my comics are ramshackly, <laughs> but I believe in them. I believe in the school. I believe in all the students that come through the school. I believe in my own work. And, um, but uh, it doesn't look like the other stuff. And I, and I, and I'm okay with that. And, it's hard for me to be okay with that, but definitely younger self would be like, dude, relax, that's fine. <laughs> you know, it's fine. Don't belong, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I love that. that. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, okay, sure. so I'm going to um, dive into some Q&A here. Okay. And um, let's see. Let's start here. So... Mandy asks, Tom, I know you don't do Instagram or Facebook intensively. How do you find your students? How do they find you? <laughs> I was going to ask about this, but I, Mandy got to do it for me. Well, the, the the Saw Instagram is pretty regularly updated by by Emma um, Emma Jensen, our, our co-conspirator. Um, I, I think she's doing the Facebook, too. <laughs> I don't use it that often. Um, every once in a while, I think now now is the time I'm going to get started on it again. Um, you know, that's something interesting. Not to get too into it, but uh, but when I was starting the school in 2012, I thought also like I was think like I was saying with the with my own artistic career that all it would take is like you build up and you grow and you get better and you grow and you grow and you and you know and then things become easy. And it didn't work out that way. We had like a, a good year where we had six students. That was our first year. The next year we had six students, but at least they were all paying full price, you know. And then the next year I think we had um, nine. And then the next year we had 11. And I was like, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. And eventually we'll get to 25 or 30 or something. But we never did. It sort of stopped at some point. And, um, and I realized like, oh, you have to put a different kind of effort in to keep this going. And uh, it took me a long time to figure out what that effort was, and, and I still don't know. Um, but it involved going to conventions. It involved um, getting out personally more. Honestly, we made uh, like I've made class visits that have brought in students. We're like, you know, I mean, two two students came from Seattle because I visited their class. Like sometimes it's like really low uh, uh, return on effort. You know, it's like oh, all I have to do is travel across the country to get new students. So um, we do a little Facebook advertising and um, and uh, social media is a, a tricky one that I haven't really. I don't know. It's These tricky. kinds of things it's help. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a longer conversation to have. 
Yeah, well, maybe maybe one day we'll do, do that conversation. <laughs> sure. Um, Gerardo asks, how do you balance your creative life, your primary income source, and family life with taking care of you? How do you keep healthy? Oh, well, the pandemic has made everyone unhealthy. I'm miserable. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Like, so, um, I'm not stretching enough. I'm not moving enough. I'm angry at my family all the time. They're ang they're angrier at me than I am at them, let me say. Um, uh, well, but that's specific to the pandemic. In other times, I've gotten good all my life, or all, at least all my adult life, I've sort of scraped away at the margins of the time I have to either do my creative work or to like exercise and things like that. And, um, and that's just how I do it. I just find it in the, in the margins. If I can, if I have 20 minutes here, I'll, again, sort of pre-pandemic, I'll go for a run. I don't know why I'm not running now. I'm just too depressed, you know, but, but pre-pandemic, 15 minutes here, I'll go for a run. I'll sit. I, we, we installed a hammock at Saw at one point, and that was my way to be like, okay, going in the hammock for 15 minutes. And that, that was like, definitely, that was like C3PO turning himself off. You know, that was definitely like taking care of Tom for 15 minutes. You know, those kinds of things, you know, not everybody's the same way, but I could get by on those little scraps of time on, on like just for myself. But also, again, working on my own stuff, it, it feeds me so much. Um, and maybe that just keeps me going too. So even if I work 20 minutes in, in a day on, on my, my sort of the personal thing that you called heart-centered, um, if I work for that little on that, it'll really feed me, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, uh, something that we say around the Creative Focus Workshop that um, creative practice is self-care. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the originator of that uh, statement is um, Alexander Chi, who's going to be our next guest. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so that brings us uh, to another question, actually. Uh, Chris is asking about finding the physical space for SA and how, you know, how did you go about thinking about building an actual physical school? How did you find space? You know, that kind of thing. I just I just wandered around neighborhoods and asked who owned this building and what's this space and I no seriously you know you get on Facebook and you say who knows somebody who I like again like just like starting a band you're like you just keep your ear to the ground you just talk to people you just try um, you just try to find the resources you need um, and the resources we need wasn't big our first school was really tiny we've moved four times. <laughs> We're about to move actually next week, so that'll be the fourth. Um, but it was really tiny. It served the purposes we had of, of having the small school. We got a lot of great work done. We taught a lot of great people there. But really, I just, I, I, you know, I, in another culture, I might be in prison. You know, I take, I'd never take no for an answer when it comes to like, you can't do this, you can't do that. Luckily, I'm not in food service. I'm just, <laughs> I just teach art. <laughs> but I would be like, can we use that? You know, can we use that building? What's it's a little run down, you know, it's, um, what, what's it, what's it, uh, zoned for? Oh, whatever. It doesn't matter. We'll just try it. You know, <laughs> seriously, like, um, you're just so punk rock and DIY. I love it. It's just, I, <laughs> but, you know, you know, again, but if like, if I had listened to all the reasons not, not to start a school, I wouldn't have started the school. If I listened to even two of them, I wouldn't have started it. And it's, <laughs> my life is so much better that I started the school and so many other lives are better that I started it. And nobody's in prison yet. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the fears, though, right? You know, if you fear, if you try something, you're like, ooh, this is scary. It's like, what's scary about art? Nothing is scary about art except you're just going to feel weird and bad. But you, nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to wind up in prison. Making a mess, telling a lousy story, none of those things hurt hurt you that much. And yeah. Yeah. No, just taking action and seeing what happens as a result of it and not dying and then uh -huh. again. that's yeah. that's the key that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you defeat all your fears yeah yeah not dying. um yeah so we have so many awesome questions we definitely do not have time for many more of them in fact i'm going to cut it off here um but maybe i'll get back and in, into the comments and and comment on those questions thanks everybody for posting your really thoughtful questions i really appreciate it um, but I want to make sure we're respecting everybody's time, and it's just about an hour here. So, um, Tom, I just want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure and an honor. And awesome. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah. 
however you want. Um, how can how can people find you? Um, sawcomics.org is the best way. Uh, Learn.sawcomics.org is the is the online comics portal. Sawcomics.org is the, the, the sort of brick and mortar. Um, we, we have tons of stuff there. Like I said, multiple streams of revenue. We have a gazillion classes. It's disorganized. I'm trying to disor. I'm trying to organize it, but always such on the run. Such good classes and such yeah. good. I mean, Tom, you're just you're a transformational teacher. There's a lot of former students I see here today in the chat, and oh wow, it's just a testament to you know, who you are as a teacher that people are following you and with you, you know, for so long afterwards. Um, can we find That's your nice. books there or is there someplace else we should be looking for those? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've okay. gotten bad. I've gotten Get bad at me on that one. <laughs> I've got, I've gotten bad at personal promotion. I've gotten good at school promotion. So as far as personal promotion, like the, if, if it's got a spine, you can buy it at the usual online locations, you know, um, if it's my my mini comics and things that then um uh i don't know send me an email or find me at a convention <laughs> seriously these days i was like when we were finishing up our graphic novel group we we're like try to try to imagine like the perfect person who wants your book and i was like they're just somebody who wanders to my table at mocha you know that's all i wanted was just one person to show up at mocha and say hey he's where's your new book I'm like here it is like I don't have big dreams anymore I'm happy to I'm happy with the connections that are there like the um so I'm not a grand uh, a great salesperson of my own work but we'll do but, it we'll try to do it for you okay we'll yeah. get these when we um when we run this as a podcast we'll put them in the in the show notes oh I'm happy to I'm happy to send you the correct kind of links things. and all that yes. stuff but it's yes. it's not easily all Findable. aggregated yeah yes <laughs> all right um, and thank you uh, to the audience, for everybody who's here live, all of you who are coming here in replay, those of you who are here listening to the podcast, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, our next live guest is Alexander Chi on January 13th, and Alexander is the author of Edinburgh and um, The Queen of the Night and How to um, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, which is a collect collection of memoir essays. Um, despite its title <laughs> and he's amazing I'm very excited for that conversation you can find that on our cha Crowdcast channel and um, we will be mailing out about it and having updates but that's January 13th at the same time um, and also if you want to make sure that you catch up on all of our Crowdcast events you can always follow us on Crowdcast um, which is at uh, crowdcast.io slash Jessica Abel J-E-S-S-I-C-A-A-B-E-L and you'll get updates automatically. So thanks everybody for being here. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Tom, for being my first guest. I thanks, feel, Jess. That was really great. Oh, so warm and fuzzy about this. So <laughs> awesome. Thanks everybody who, um, who who was here. I don't see the list. I'm sorry, but feel free to send me an email. 